Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest, Tim Brown, is the co-founder and CEO of Allbirds, the sustainable shoe and apparel company and maker of, quote, the world's most comfortable shoe. But Tim doesn't come from the world of footwear or tech, as you might expect. It was his experience as a World Cup soccer player for New Zealand and his background at design school that inspired him to develop the concept of Allbirds. In our conversation today, we talk about how Allbirds began as a curiosity project, the drive for continuous improvement and how tackling tough problems can unlock your purpose. I love that. Let's jump right in. Here's my conversation with Tim Brown. Well, Tim, what a treat to have you on. This is going to be fun. I I tell you what, I mean, you are a professional athlete, right? You played pro soccer. How would you describe, you know, kind of high level for me, your your soccer career? I would sort of say it was one of trying really hard and working really hard and being very fortunate to have some outsized success and being part of some really, really special teams that were, you know, that were able to do some special things and in the process made some lifelong friends out of the back of it. So I don't think it gets much better than that. Sports being a gift. I left New Zealand when I was an 18-year-old. I'd I'd uh, fallen in love with playing football, but also design and was able to kind of weave those two things together on a soccer scholarship to the University of Cincinnati. My my uh, auntie in New Zealand was American. She'd gone to the University of North Carolina. She was a Tar Heel. She had been a strong advocate of this opportunity and really, really pushed me. And so I, I made a video of highlights of me playing in like the local national league and sent them out and ended up getting a bunch of scholarship offers from about six different schools and ended up choosing Cincinnati because of this incredible design school they had. And so I, I showed up in Cincinnati, Ohio as an 18 year old and, uh, and ended up, you know, that was really the, that was really the beginning. So that design component was inside of you when you were out on the field till you were almost 31 as you transitioned from college to the pros. That was something that you had an eye on all the time. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 that was in many ways the thing that I intuitively got. Sport was the thing that I, I really enjoyed, but I had to work my absolute tail off. You know, I, I, I kind of I went to Cincinnati and I, I fell, you know, head over heels, and and I was like, oh my god, this is incredible. The facilities, Cincinnati was the, the number one basketball team in the nation at the time. Kenyon Martin was there you know, the whole energy around college sports. And then you get to study as well at this incredible school. I just, it was, I couldn't get enough of it. And I got through four years there. We, you know, we had a really good run at Cincinnati. I uh, didn't win any titles, but I had an opportunity on the back end to, to play professionally and and sort of followed it. But I, I, I don't think that I ever really, it wasn't sort of like, hey, this guy's so good. This is a no-brainer. This is more like, hey, there's a lot of qualities he has there's something to be done here, but how badly do you want it? It was kind of like one of those ones. And I didn't get drafted and ended up going to the Los Angeles Galaxy kind of as a as a free agent who missed the draft. Uh, and so that was my sort of my, my first sort of uh, uh, entrance into the into the professional game. Yeah, I love that story. I just did a TED Talk on how it's not about talent, it's about drive, which is clearly what you had a ton of inside of you. I, I love that. How did you transition, though, from pro sports as a pro athlete to obviously what you've built and created, I know, with a team of people, but to founding a shoe company? Well, so, you know, it's interesting. So I I promptly got released by the Galaxy pretty quickly and pretty ruthlessly. So that was my first taste of, okay, see you later. And they sent me down to one of their feeder teams, the Richmond Kickers, which played in... um, like the USL, and I, I I played there for for a year or two, and kind of I had a great time. It was fantastic, but the sport was still, uh, you know, I, I was I was sort of, oh, you know, what am I going to do with do with my life? And then and then I got, I got an opportunity to go go to England, and then ultimately 
found myself playing in the A League in Australia. So my first proper professional opportunity in a real, a really great league that was a few years behind MLS, but of a very high standard. And that was really, you know, what's what started. And along the way, I kind of got a taste, Molly, for the possibility of New Zealand going to a World Cup. We hadn't been uh, to a soccer World Cup since 1982, so it was a big deal. And we had this incredible confluence of talent and players. And once I got my, my mind fixated on that, I... And I was with this really special team. This, you know, we probably saw that opportunity in, in like 2004, and a whole bunch of things had to come together for us to qualify. But I really, I just, I, I made it the most important thing in my life, and I worked and worked and worked and worked. And I, all I wanted to do was be part of a New Zealand team that went to the World Cup, and we were ultimately able to achieve that. And it was, it was really, really special. And along the way, I kind of realised that. I did this big hole in my life and I actually started what, the business that would become Allbirds as a curiosity project on the side of my professional sport. It was a reaction to the free gear. Quite honestly, the best thing about professional sport is the free gear. <laughs> it's and, so true, right? It's so true. And I, uh, But it was all made from plastic and it was all logoed. And as a sort of a minimalist that had been trained at this design school in Cincinnati, I thought, oh my God, isn't there an opportunity maybe to do this differently? So I set out literally making making shoes for my teammates with a with a very clear philosophy in 2007 and I was doing it on the side I mean they were I mean these guys were making fun of me like that that's if you can make a product for a locker room which is a pretty challenging place at the best of times and you can you make these guys pay because they paid for a product that they were getting for free then you know your business can fly so I look back on it, it was a pretty it was a pretty interesting test ground but that's really where it, where it started on the side of my sport how difficult was the shift? You know, I mean, so often I see this and saw this so often, you know, with, with athletes, it becomes your identity, what you do. And, and then when that jersey comes off your back and you shift into the business world, that can be really tough for a lot of athletes. How did that work for you? I mean, it sounds like it was threaded inside of you all along the way, which was a power, I'm sure that helped. But what was that like for you making that shift when that jersey comes off the back it's a little bit of a different ball game when you step out into that business world when all you knew was was being Tim the soccer player. Well, you know, I, it's interesting. I sort of prepared for it for quite some time, and I, I had um, the benefit of, 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 of some interesting case studies. Like my, my cousin had been an All Black captain. He had uh, played, you know, rugby at the highest level for New Zealand, and then gone off and studied, and actually ended his career a little bit early and gone to sort of Oxford and Cambridge and. I was I was I was always so you know looked up to him and so there was these sort of interesting case studies and I was increasingly feeling like you know the World Cup was incredible and then once we achieved it I knew it was it was maybe an interesting time for me to start to explore you know some of my other dreams and I copped a fair amount of criticism you know uh, in the end but I, I walked away with a couple of years left on my contract in the middle of probably being as fit and as clear about my game and contribution to the game as I'd ever been to go, to go study. And so I, I, I made that decision pretty proactively. I didn't want to be the last person at the party. I didn't want to have that meeting in the office, you know? And so I went off and did it and, and, and the shoe project had been a little bit of a catalyst for it. So, you know, I, I'm, um, you know, maybe a little bit different. And that being said, you know, when I found myself as a student again in London, spending all my savings, going back to study all the subjects at school that I'd avoided, definitely had that moment. And and I, ha I had the moment, you know, people ask you kind of, oh, you know, what do you do? There was always this amazing story, you know, and you, or if you traveled and, you know, in the customs forms, Molly, like you fill in like what your thing is, you'd be like athlete. And then like I'd fill it in and say student. I was like, oh my God, I'm starting again, completely starting again. And and there's def it's definitely very, very hard. And, but it's like anything in, in life, Molly, like, so you've got to go backwards if you want to go forwards again. And I, I thought a lot about it and I prepared for it. And even then it was hard. So I, I know from personal experience with a lot of friends, that transition is is really, really difficult. But I love it. I mean, it's so true. I think the more that you start greasing the wheels against that before an athlete steps away, the better, obviously. And, and you're a testament to that, no doubt. There is a mindset that lives inside of great athletes, no doubt. How did you lift that mindset up and apply it? to the creation, to the building, to what you have now with, with, and are continuing to, to pour into and build with all birds. You know, I had to lean on to the sport because I didn't have anything else. So, and particularly now as we build a business and this is really my first job that doesn't involve kicking a ball around, 
you know, we're now sort of five, six years into it. I lean on that experience because I don't have anything else. And it's, it's been really, really helpful. And, and look, there's some obvious things, right? Like getting an idea, people to believe an idea. You, like, I mean, this was a bad, I like to sort of say a bad idea for a long time. The idea of shoes made from natural materials, focusing on sustainability. Like, I'm mean, just 2007 to 2012, I worked on that. And the number of people that sort of shot that down were, you know, there's a long list. There's a long list, and I, you know, I keep many of them and many of them in the back of my my black book. <laughs> no, it, it, the truth being, like, you know, look, it was I was trying to work it out, and so that tenacity, you know, that that willingness to kind of see the criticism as a as sort of uh, an opportunity rather than the end of the road, I think was good. And I, you know, if I look back, I mean, I think as an athlete, you inherently understand that you don't get good at something overnight. You you do. A great day, then you do another good day, and and and, I, and what I've kind of come to think of it as Molly is like the compounding impact of getting a, a little bit better every day. If you commit to something and you work at it incrementally, and you train as an athlete to do that, over the long time that compounds and that can lead to outsize impact. And more often than not, what happens is you you change it. You're looking for, particularly entrepreneurially, and I was guilty of this. You're looking for the silver bullet. You're looking for the new technology or the new idea that's going to just sort of, and the reality is it's not how it works. You get a little bit better, a little bit better, you tweak it, you adjust, you adjust, you listen to the feedback, you don't listen to all of it, you adjust, you adjust. And then over time, you develop mastery of something only because you're willing to get into that routine. And so the routine of practice and enhancement, I think is probably the biggest gift of everything from sport. And it was that, and I, you know, you just, you just got to trust the process. And sometimes you'll you work really, really hard and you'll get a you'll get a little win. And then sometimes you work really, really hard. You won't see a victory for a long time, but you trust the process over in the long run, you know, that's how success is built. I think there's no other way. Yeah, it's all about the reps, right? It's all about it's all about the process, grinding it, getting after it a little bit every day. I love that. I mean, that's fantastic. And I, you know, when along the way, Tim, right? Like you talked about how, you know, people told you, Man, you're crazy, right? What are you talking about? I mean, a shoe company, you know. And did you ever take that in and doubt yourself? And if you did, how did you overcome that? Well, 100%. You know, I mean, that's the thing. I thought well, when I played sport, Molly, I, like you're operating with a lot of doubt and you make it, the crowds there, particularly for me, like I was always kind of having to prove myself that I belonged to be there. And it kind of, it wears on you over time. And then I assumed that that was wrapped up in sport for me. So when I would finish sport, I would live this blissful life of never doubting yourself and not being under pressure. And then a couple of things, re- really strangely things happened. One, I really missed it. It was that sense of kind of needing to be under pressure in some form that like if I was running a corner store, I'd want it to be a really good corner store. <laughs> like I, it, there was an, al- there's an al- element of the competitiveness that's just sort of in you. And then the second thing is, that doubt is just sort of part of your psychology. It's actually the thing that allows you to be good at something. Because if you didn't, you know, really care, you, you just operate as normal. You, so the, the 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 doubt is actually it's actually the fuel for your ability to get better better at something. And I learned, I think, in the course of my sporting career to master it. And as a uh, you know, entrepreneurship, which is in in many ways in a far greater mental challenge, you realize that doubt is, is is the bit that you have to harness. And if you can work it out. So every single day, but even today, like, I mean, I had a meeting this morning. I didn't, I didn't do great. Um, you know, I just, I could have been better and I'm frustrated. And, and that's just a part of my psychology. And, the, you know, you've got to manage it both sides because if you do that too much. People don't want to work with you and you're not fun to be around and you can't really ever enjoy the successes. So you have to work on that on both sides. But the idea of feeling unsure is, in fact, the higher you go up in sport, I think the intensity of that feeling gets greater i think the best athletes have that even more you know it's so it's it's i I think it's an unavoidable part of achievement when you see yourself go to that spot where you're like man i don't know right like am i the guy to be you know in this spot doing this is there something you tell yourself when you see yourself slip into that self-doubt that maybe you know somebody like me when i feel that way right that i could lift up and apply to my own life yeah, I think it's I think it's it's one of those ones where it's actually quite a good place to sort of live for a little bit. You don't want to be there for a long time, but you don't want to be afraid of going there and just sort of sitting a little bit and feeling it because 
usually when you're feeling it, it's because you've got some form of external criticism or data point that might suggest that you're right to feel that way. You know, like something has impacted you. And if you sit there a little bit, what I've found is you're able to, you're able to extract what you need from the feeling and then move on. And if you move out of too quickly, you don't, those data points and the inputs that you're getting, the reason that you're feeling that way, usually you need to sift through it a little bit and there'll be some really like great nuggets that will be the thing that avoids you going there again. So there's a little moment of sitting with it, looking into the eye of it, and then having the courage to sort of really, really discard the bits that, quite frankly, like, you know, you never, if you're not fast, you're not going to start running really fast all of a sudden. So there's certain things you can control and others you can't. Getting really good at discarding them and move, moving on really quickly. Like, I like to think that, like, the best people that I had, um, you know, played sport with sort of had the mind of a goldfish. They had the ability to kind of process, absorb, and then just like go again. And and so I've, I've tried to develop that little moment to live and then discard and then kind of move on really, really, really fast. And, uh, but that, but, so I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of the structure in my mind. And a lot of that can be sometimes visual, you know, like I'll, I'll sit with a problem and then when I stand up, I'm done with it. So like some of it can actually be out of routine and habit. Yeah, that's cool, right? Like it's visual and it sounds like it's even can be physical. Like you sit with it, you stand up and say, I'm going to leave that there. And, and, you know, to me, what's cool about what you're describing, right, is you're also sort of saying, be self-aware of when you're there. And then, and, and, and great athletes and coaches talk about this all the time, right? Control the controllables. I mean, you've got to lean into what you can control and let go of what you can't. I had this incredible experience. I actually got injured just before the World Cup and I went into the All Blacks. I mentioned it before, but I mean, for anyone who follows sport, they're a pretty iconic sort of team and environment. And I was at a bit of a tough, a really pressurized situation. And I went in and spent some time with a guy called Gilbert Anoka, who's their sort of like a sports psychologist. I've never done anything like that in my sport. And I assumed there was going to be, I don't, the guy was the guy was going to hypnotize me or something, Molly. And, and it was nothing like that. He just, he literally is sort of, he just got up on a whiteboard and it was super casual. He's like, what are the bits you can control? What are the bits you can't? Let's just make a strategy here to kind of work out of the situation as best you can. And it was like, there's no, there's no sort of like silver bullet with the stuff. You just, there's a discipline in the way that you think and attack problems. And the ability to, um, to feel bad about something allows you to feel great about it the other way. You just, you just got to balance those things out and just be kind of kind to yourself. And at the same time, a little tough on yourself too. So there's, there's, there's both ways. And I, I thought a lot about, just you know strategies to allow those things to frustrate you and move on and, and equally you know when things are going really well to be you know a little bit uh, even a little bit more humble a little bit more cautious than you might otherwise be because you know it's just a good way to be right down the middle how do you approach filtering feedback you know i'm sure there was a sort of a methodology in, in sports but it's probably not too dissimilar to how you do it now as you lead all birds it's funny that you touch on that because i think i mean if there's a few rules I think the idea of of living life without feedback is a huge missed opportunity. You should seek it at every opportunity and get good at doing so. Like, and you know, you want to ask people like, how can you get better? That's a good, that's a good mindset. It's a growth mindset. And equally, if you listen to all of it, you're an you're an idiot. You're a complete idiot. The whole trick is to filter it out. Like the number of experts that Joey and I spoke with in the early days of All Birds were, you know, were, were lengthy and they were critical because they knew so much and. We had to kind of go back to, hey, what do we believe or what do we know that they don't know and why are we different? And pressure test our instincts, but ultimately decide to do what we want to do because we want to do it. And at the end of the day, there's certain things in life that give you energy. There's certain things that you enjoy that others might want to enjoy. And certainly in an entrepreneurial context, I might expand it to more of a life context. You know, the ability to hold the pen and do what you want to do. <laughs> if, if you don't have, if you don't maintain that, what's the point? And so I've always sort of thought, certainly as an entrepreneur, you know, there's certain things that I've come into it that are unique and there's certain things that give me energy. And I need to make sure that they're a big part of my day, my week, my month, my year, my business, because if they're not, I'm not going to be useful. And that instinct, I think, becomes the sort of central place where you filter some of that stuff. And sometimes people just, they just, they just write. And other times, you know what, you know what, like, I don't care. And, and actually, I, you know, I had one interview question that that I ask everyone that I interview here at Woolworths. It's like, what's a piece of feedback that you that you've taken on board and internalized that's really had a profound impact in your professional career? And what's a piece of feedback do you ignore, whether that be on a regular basis, more than once, uh, because you are who you are and you're going to do it however the hell you want to do it. 
And it's revealing to me because I think you can only answer it if you've thought deeply about it. But there's also an element of confidence, you know what I mean? Like, I, hey, I just, I'm, I'm, this is how I'm going to do it. In just a second, we'll get back to the conversation. But first, I want to share some exciting news. My new TED Talk is out now, and it's all about the secrets to a champion mindset. For more than 15 years as a sports agent, I had a front row seat to peak performance. What was the difference between those who maximize their potential and those who don't? You think it's talent, but it's really drive. And the real magic happens when the drive to achieve is replaced by something more sustainable, the drive to get better. The best know this, that the view from the summit is nice, but it's the climb that makes it all worthwhile. Check it out. Watch it now at mollyfletcher.com backslash TED Talk. Was the social mission, right, sustainability, was that always a part of your plan, right? Like, I mean, you saw a problem clearly inside of the footwear industry that made you want to do something about it. Was the sustainability piece threaded through the very beginning of that journey for you? Well, that's a great, another great segue to a lesson from sport. So I, I find myself playing sport in the A-League, living a boyhood dream, getting paid to kick a ball around. And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, this isn't as much fun as I thought it would be. This is a job and I have to perform and it's hard and there's a lot of pressure. And if I play poorly on the weekend, I, you know, that's when I had to get off social media because people say not very nice things about you and it's hard. And then along the way, I'm like, oh, wow. But I've got a taste of playing for my country. I see what that means to other people that I really care about, to my family. I see what the type of impact that can have if done really well. I'm prepared to do whatever it takes to be part of a New Zealand team that did something for for a larger, you know, in a more purposeful way. It unlocks something in me and then as you know, an entrepreneur, I found myself making shoes, shoes out of wool. Now, I come from New Zealand with lots of sheep. I love wool and, and the farming community and the story there is an amazing one. But my father at one point was calling me a cobbler and making fun of me in a, in a gentle way. I'm like, what are you doing? Because I was complaining about how hard, it, how hard it was. And, you know, if you don't want to do it, stop doing it. Why, why shoes? And it was like, I, I didn't have that answer. And then along the way, I met Joey, my co-founder, and he had a, a vision for the environment, for natural materials an insight that or a belief that maybe the whole world was going to need to rethink the, the way things were made, which is, I think, we're in chapter one of that happening right now. Uh, and all of a sudden, it was it was an unlock. I was like, this is the bit. This is this is the this is the New Zealand piece of me from sport. This is the the unlock in, in business. And so it took some time to find it. And when I did, there was absolutely no looking back. And uh, we launched All Birds together in 2015, launched the business officially on the 1st of March 2016, moved to San Francisco and started building this company. And, and we haven't looked back. It's got even harder from that point. But the idea that we were doing something uh, that was you know, for bigger, bigger than ourselves was, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't get enough of that. That's, you know, if you're fortunate enough in your career to, to, to be to be going after a, a, a purpose driven problem, then it doesn't get much better than that. I don't think not. How do you measure your environmental impact? We've been on a journey to work that out. And I think initially, you know, I want to distinguish just one really important foundational thing, though. The distinction between passion and purpose is really important. I think I can be passionate about, you know, the Golden State Warriors, or I can be passionate about Manchester United or the latest movie or Netflix series I've seen. Purpose is different. Purpose is a problem worth solving that is usually very complicated, very difficult, and few trying to do it or have done it well. And so there's, you know, um, I think that's it's really important because I think the purpose thing, passion is 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 a little bit like ice cream. Purpose is something much more complicated and 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 deep and and and, and meaningful. So that was really sort of foundational for us. And and in the environmental piece, we we came into it. We knew we wanted to 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 do something meaningful, but we didn't quite really understand exactly how to measure that. And so we tried really hard. And then along the way, we realized that sustainability was this complicated thing that means 10 different things to 10 different people. And there was an opportunity to make our sustainable mission about carbon. So in really simple terms, everything that we make has a carbon footprint. The world has a 
carbon footprint. America has a carbon footprint. New Zealand has a carbon footprint. The transport industry has a carbon footprint. Fashion industry has a carbon footprint. It, everything has a carbon footprint. It collectively adds up to a number that we need to reduce. We need to find ways to make the products and services we use every day in more carbon efficient ways. And so the starting point for that is to measure it. And we've started to you know, obviously understand the footprint of our business. And now we label every product, every pair of shoes with a carbon footprint um, involved in their production uh, in the same way that calories go on food. And we're now trying to reduce it. We've got a really clear plan to halve that by 2025. We actually just launched a um, the lowest carbon footprint performance running shoe with Adidas today, a partnership we've been working on for a year and a half. It just dropped today and it's 2.96 kilograms of carbon. And we think about half a hamburger. Um, so, you know, when you can measure it, then you can reduce it. And we're now uh, taxing ourselves. So charging ourselves for every kilogram of carbon that we emit through offsets and bonusing our executives to reduce this number. The entire business is focused on this and, so I think it for us, our point of view is this is where the you know, this is the future of how every business and every product and service that we use and buy will will be measured. And so we we like to think we're kind of we're getting out ahead of that. How does that change your daily journey, both for you, for Joey, for your team, having this greater purpose or this mission that you lean into? Well, I, I think I think it expands the scope of you know possibility of what the business can be. I think I've seen. People, people come in here and work harder, work faster, work more, more meaningfully. We've attracted this incredible group of people, extraordinary talent that are sometimes not always choosing the best paid option to go after something that really matters. And so the collective spirit, it's, it's hard to sort of really measure, you know, measure that, but you can feel it, you know. And then I, I think in many ways when, you, when you're truly engaging with purpose in, in the context of business you're making something harder like we're we're going to make things but we're trying to make them out of natural and sustainable materials and often cases with more complicated supply chains or um with materials that haven't been used before i mean a, a particular yeah theory is you know that uh synthetic materials derived from oil plastic essentially we've been innovating in for 50 years and natural materials have sort of been left alone and so there's a lot of catch-up and so some of the work that we're doing is harder we're also imposing taxes on ourselves a carbon number but therein lies the opportunity therein lies the point of difference therein lies the future of what you could be so i think it often makes it harder but i think in the fullness of time it makes it better and i think the ability to be coming in if you're fortunate enough as an entrepreneur to be able to tackle a problem that really matters. I, again, I don't think that it gets better than that. How did you navigate culture, right? So you and Joey come together, you, you obviously expand the team, and you've continued to expand and grow, right, All, every day. How have you maintained the culture inside of the organizations as it has scaled? Well, I give, I give Joey a lot of, we did three things, and I give Joey a lot of credit for this. We, we, we came in and we did, we did three things. And and they're all wrapped up in the in the idea that you know culture. You need to be intentional about the culture that you want to create, and oftentimes that's left to chance. It sort of happens, and inevitably, culture is a is an organic thing that grows and changes and morphs and evolves as new people add. You know, it goes. It's, this has gone from Joey and I, and his dog Walter, to now seven hundred plus people. So there's that along the way this thing has become a whole lot of other things and grown and developed. But we were very intentional from the beginning around defining and decoding the type of culture that we wanted to be a part of. And I think we had six people. We spent a couple of days on it at the time. And I was a little skeptical. You know, I'd, I was like, this is really, this really, and he'd had a really positive experience doing something similar and we tailored it. And we did three things. So we defined a mission statement, like a definitive, declarative, timeless statement that encapsulated our purpose that was about what we were going to be. And in our particular, you know, our mission statement was that we were going to make better things in a better way. And in, inherent in that is a lot of things. It was about things, not just shoes. It was about getting better, not being perfect. So it's about continuous improvement. And it was also about methods of make, not, you know, so it was it was broad enough, but specific enough to be ownable. And, and this idea of getting better is an inherent in the way that we think about the business. We then defined three values. For us, it was simplicity, intentionality, and curiosity, and they became part of the way we celebrated our wins, how we hired 
folks, how we review performance. They haven't changed since we started, and they're kind of inherent in in the business. So they were codified. You shouldn't have more than five. I don't think three is an optimal number, and we went back and forth for a long, long time to sort of zoom in on those three and the sort of backstories and context behind them. And then the third thing, we wrote a vision 10 years in the future, and so 2015, just before launching the business, we imagined what a morning would be like in 2025 if everything that we did and all our dreams were realized. And we there were six of us, I think, working at the time. We all wrote down a pen, wrote down a vision. It didn't leave the paper. Your pen doesn't leave the paper, I think, for 45 minutes or something. You just write. And we wove all these, story, all these stories into a story, a vision. And we share that vision now with everyone that joins, uh, that interviews with the company. They can see sort of what we imagined. And we haven't changed it. And this, it's eerie how whenever we're facing a big decision or we've had a couple of like real pivotal moments, go back and read that. And the answers are usually in there. It's eerie. And before your, you know, the day-to-day small steps of building something start to tug you away, to have written a story about the future. And I, I was skeptical about this. I was like, oh, God, I this is an American thing. You know, we're going to write this like kind of <laughs> fluffy, fluffy story. I was like, Joe, Crazy come Americans. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, was, it was honestly the best thing. So those are the three things I'd recommend for anyone starting out. And the, the use of visioning is something that we've, we've continued to do. And it's so powerful because I think your mind kind of, you know, the storytelling, your mind knows – you know, it's just, it's so powerful. So I, I just recommend that, you know, that, um, that you think about those those things. Let me ask you this. How detailed do you get when you write that out? Write that vision statement. That It's very detailed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, like literally it was like, what does it smell like? And what, you know, what are the, what's on the walls? And, and how did you get to work? And, you know, who else is there? And, uh, you know, what's, what is it? it, it so the, the, the more vivid, the better. And I, I think you want to be able to sort of feel it. And when you're forced to sort of zoom forward in the future, I think you, know, you start to paint a picture. And then, you know, I, I always like to say, so, sort of say, like when, you, when you're, you're building something, you want to firmly hold on to that vision and then be extraordinarily nimble in the short-term steps that you have to take to get where you want to go. And so, so painting that picture is really, really important. And for us, it was one of the, the best things we did. And, you know, again, Joey, I wouldn't tell him this, obviously, but he deserves a large amount of credit for that. Great job. <laughs> I'm going to send him this podcast. Yeah, yeah don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> How have you maintained the discipline and the focus as you've scaled and expanded? Would you say at some level, Tim, that it's this, what you just described, this clear mission statement? you know, your core values, your three core values, and then the vision. I mean, has that what helped you? Because obviously as a business owner, you have lots of opportunities. I'm sure your door is getting pounded on every day with, why are you doing that? What about that? What? And you've got to stay focused as you expand and scale. Do you lean into those three things to do that? What's your process there? Well, it's it's funny you say three things. I'm, I always kind of, it's a bit of a joke, but I always try and think in terms of three things. I, I, I think, um, you know, it's a little bit about culture, of course. It's a little bit about vision. It's a little bit about thinking big and then acting really small. We haven't always got it right. There's always a little bit of an art and science. Like, I, you know, I think if you stay in one place and you don't innovate, and you know, that's a very dangerous place to be. And if you take on too many things and lose focus, you know, you can very easily lose your way. There's a We try to be students of history, spend a lot of time really looking at the patterns and the arc of, of, of things and, and, and you know, finding finding our own way, but but learning the lessons from the past, and then, you know, I, I I sort of think at the end of the day, I'll give you an example. Like great brands, usually great businesses, they tend to become famous or great because they they own a singular idea or concept, and you you don't get rewarded for the twenty seven things that you do pretty well. You get re- usually rewarded and famous for the one or two things that you do in an extraordinary way, and so I think. In the context of, of building a business too, there's a lot of shiny lights and a lot of emails from investors and people. So how you're disciplined and you define where you want to go, you define the culture, and then you're very, very selective around how you use your time and who you use, you know, who you spend that with is is part of the game. I you know, and, and I, I I literally I mean, I ride my bike into work every day, just about every day, and I I'm trying to think, well, what are the three things I should try and do today that will give me the most energy, will help the team win? And it's not always sometimes the easiest things, but like, if I, this will be a, a good 
good day. And then obviously we ladder those up into a pretty pretty careful planning process that we're getting better and better at as we grow. But I think just on a personal level, going back to the, the little three things that you can move that you really want to focus on in the short term that you believe ladder up to where you want to go. And you need both. You need both sides of that. And so I think, you know, that's kind of how I, I try and think about it. You know, I love how you talk about competition, right? And so who do you see as competition in this space? Maybe you can talk about that. And how do you think about competition? This is cool. Yeah. I, I mean, again, the sporting stuff makes that really clear. I think, as you know, as a business, there's never really been a direct competitor. And in some cases, I mean, I just gave the example earlier of, of, of the partnership we just did with Adidas. They are a direct competitor in our space. And through the lens of our purpose, it made sense in, a, in that particular context to work with them to achieve something bigger than uh, what either company could do by themselves. So I think, you know, the competitive thing is different. You can assume that that's other brands. It, it oftentimes, more often than not, I see it certainly in our team, more often than not, the internal desire, competitiveness is the biggest thing. <laughs> and then you obviously have the external partners and people that are doing really innovative things. So, I mean, I think you, you just got to think about competition pretty broadly. I think the competition you have with yourself, you set high standards. It's really important. We talked about that a little earlier in this conversation. You know, it needs to be managed, but it's a really important part of achievement. I think other brands and businesses, yeah, you, you you want to have a little a little black book and oftentimes cultivating competition, you know, and, and understanding it is really important for pushing achievement, particularly with a team. You know, these guys are the best. We want to beat them. How are we going to do that? And so I, 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 never, I never think it's something to shy away from. And I think Equally, in the case of Adidas, you know, the competition sometimes doesn't always necessarily need to be the other business. It can also be the broader challenge or purpose that you're going after. But it's a huge motivating tool, and I think people shouldn't shy away from talking about it, thinking about it, and engaging with it. What would you say is harder, Tim, building the company or leading it? I don't know if I draw a distinction between those two things. Like, you know, when you start a business as I did, and you know, by myself, and then with Joey you're both building and leading. There isn't anyone else. And I, I think you, you have to continue to to wear both those hats all the way through. You know, And I, I think um, inherent in the idea of building, I think, is humility, which is, at least from my point of view, an extraordinarily important part of leadership. And the idea that you can, you can always be better. If we're always building, we've got so many things that we're doing well and so many things we could be doing better. And if I went back and spoke to myself in 2007 and sort of said where we would be as a publicly traded company with 700 employees and offices in a few different countries, I would have laughed at you. I would have said, there's no way that's happening. But now that we're here, now that we sit here, I'm, I, I realize the potential opportunity for all birds and what it could be. And for us to meet this moment, there's so much work to be done. There's so much more building to be done. And I, you know, I think that type of mindset is really important to being able to, to kind of lead. And Look, I'm leading because I'm the CEO, but that, sure, that's that's a formal title. But I think that mindset of, you know, the humility to believe you could be better, you could be doing something better. Like I, I think that's a really important form of, you know, of, of leading, and that can, and that I, I see it every day in our organisation. I think if we maintain that humility, this all, you know, all birds can be, you know, have a, have a lot of impact on a lot of people over time. Well, and, and it so aligns with that athlete mindset, one in which I think the best athletes have this I've never arrived mindset, right? I'm never there. I'm never done. It's just constant desire to get better every day, which you've clearly taken into what you do and how you do it. Am I hearing you say that when you think about your leadership philosophy, would you say central to it is humility? Yeah, I, I, I think that ability to listen that ability to maintain a sense that you could always be better and that you, you've got to keep improving, and then the courage ultimately to go and make decisions and drive something forward even when it's uncertain exactly what to do. You need to toggle between both those mindsets, you know, and sometimes you need to display confidence even when you're really not sure. Um, and then other times, other times you, you know, you need to be – particularly curious because something's going so well or you need to be able to have a, a lot of different modes and the ability to toggle between different different mindsets to triangulate and guide a group of people 
on the best path. And, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't say that I have some simple three point plan on, on, on exactly what that is. It's, it's complicated, but I, I think I've, I think a lot about it and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the place that I can have the biggest impact in my current role. And so it, it's worthy of a lot of thought and reflection. Yeah. I really appreciate what you're saying though, about the, the moment, right? I mean, it's one thing for a head coach to, to show and, and really be tentative and, and listen and take feedback maybe in a practice around a play potentially, but when there's two seconds left on the clock and the coach is calling the play that everybody needs to execute again, he's got to be confident in his delivery of what he thinks those guys or gals need to step out on the court and, or the field and go do, right? A hundred percent. And the ability to, you know, to shake things off when they've not gone well and not dwell on it. And also to bring a, a relentless enthusiasm to something is really, really important. You've got to, on some deeper level, believe that what you're doing is is, is important, and 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 that's one of the, the the good fortunes about this place is that you feel a, a deep responsibility to kind of to come in and, and and drive this thing forward. So, along the way, Tim, has there been a failure, a, a, a moment that just didn't go? I mean, I can imagine there's plenty, and and given your humility and openness to feedback, I can imagine there was moments that you felt. Is there one that comes up for you that felt just horrifying in the moment as far as a failure, but it made you better. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's, there's many, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think in my, in my football career, I, I, um, I had one where I was in England, I was trying to, this was coming out of Richmond, coming out of America. I was really trying to get my first real full-time gig and I just been re- released by Swansea, which was a club in Wales. I didn't have a lot of money left. I was in a phone box, super, Super, super uh, dark and rainy. I don't know if you spend any time in the UK. Like it can be miserable in like January. You know, like that's when you 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 run and hide in pubs because it's so cold. And I rang my dad, and of course it was of course it was in New Zealand, right? So it was the flip side, and it was a barbecue, and the family was around. And it was sunny and warm, and and I was like, Dad, hey, you know, like this is really I can't. I don't think I can work this out. Like I'm not. I don't know if I'm kind of good enough to do this. And and uh, and he's like, look. You know, I don't really have a lot of time to talk because it's beautiful and warm here and we're cooking a barbecue and the whole family's around. And we're having a great deal of like we're having a great time. So I so I really don't I, I really don't want to be on this phone call because it's making me a little sad. And uh but he said, said look, he goes, you know, you we can't believe you've gone this far. We're incredibly proud of you. The fact you're over there doing that is incredibly, incredibly commendable, and not many people do it. Very few, in fact. But don't don't call me for permission to quit. If you want to quit, come back. If you want to stay, stay over there. And I'm going to get back to the barbecue. And I'm here whenever you want to chat. And I'll see you later. And it was like it was like one of those parent, parental moments. I think where what he was really saying to me is that you you hold the pen, like you're in you're in charge. And don't don't ever think that you're not. You want to keep going, great. And if you don't want to do it, don't. And if you want to go do something else, and I think that is always a great thing to kind of keep in mind. We often have a lot more control over our what we want to do than we think. And once we start to evaluate the other options, not doing it, then you start to go, oh, okay, well, maybe I don't need to be here and maybe I don't need to be chat. But actually, I, there's that elements of this as hard as it is that are really meaningful to me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go around the next corner and see. And so I think, you know, it was one of those moments where in a very light way, um, he kind of he, he just reminded me to 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 just you know more you, you control the pen a lot more than you think and and so do it your way no i think you're right i mean i think so often in life we don't take take the time to recognize we can control a lot more sometimes than we think and when we can lean into those controllables it's energizing for sure yeah, it's like the it's like the list in the in the All Blacks. You know, when I went in to see it, it's like there's a lot of stuff. You know, actually, I impact that a lot. You know, I get to choose who, who I work with, what I work on. There's going to be frustrations. Don't don't mistake short term frustrations with, hey, I'm going to pivot and get a new job every time it gets difficult. But at the end of the day, like you know, you you, you write the script a, a lot more than than you think at times. And so, and once you th- feel like that, that it becomes a little clearer, you, you know, what you want to do and what you don't want to do and what you're prepared to endure and what you're not, what you're not prepared to endure. Hey, you've been amazing. Thank you for this time. So I want to hit you with some rapid fire and then uh, we'll get you out of here to go keep crushing this new Adidas partnership. I love it. <laughs> so <laughs> are you an introvert or an extrovert? Introverted. 
but I've trained myself to be extra rooted when I need to, but it tires me out. Does it? So are you going to be a little bit more tired at the end of today after this? <laughs> no, this is good. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. The last book you read. I just read a really interesting one. Uh, we've obviously just become a public company and I've been kind of reading a lot of different uh, different, different historical stories of people that have gone through that. And I read Michael Dell's book and then I just read um, Sam Walton, the, the founder of Walmart's book, which is just the most incredible story. I mean, he started that like in his 40s and oh, and uh, it just, it was it was, uh, it was I took I took a lot from it. Mm, that's awesome. Who's a leader you admire and why? Uh, there's lots of uh, lots of different people. Like I, I triangulate around a lot of different different things. I mean, Roy Keane was a captain of Manchester United. There was a level of competitiveness. Now, I mean, that's a pretty polarizing choice because I don't think that I'm, I, you know, it's exactly how I kind of carry myself. But the 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 the, 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 the fierceness. And the desire and the competitiveness and the way that the, the way that he sort of led that team and showed up when it mattered. In the early days of my sporting career, like I, I realised that the competitiveness could be a real asset if you were, if you're able to channel it. And I definitely I was a long way away from him, but I that that was a, that was a bit of an he was an inspiring character when I when I when I played. Mm-hmm. What's one thing you wish you knew earlier in your career? It's all going to be good. Don't. <laughs> It's all going to be good. Yeah, it'll be good. And even if it doesn't work out, it'll work out. And, you know, I, I certainly wish, like, when I retired from, from sport, I had a moment with my mom talking a bit a lot about my family here, Molly, but uh, she sort of said, oh, we were so proud so proud of what, what, what happened with your sport, but we're also excited to, to have you back um, a little bit more. And that, that one really, that one really, uh, that one hit me. And, and, uh, and so I think um, I've just... I, 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 it's going to be all good, you know. And I, I think um, I, I, uh, Joey and, and 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 the ability to do this is a, we laugh a lot in the in, in, with with uh, with all birds, and we have from the beginning. And he's been a really wonderful partner in that regard. And and you know, and it's 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 you tend to sort of if you're not careful when you when you're going after something hard and you're pushing yourself, you can get you know just it's it's going to be all good. It's going to be all good. What's a habit that you've deployed in your life that has really improved your life? Uh, thinking in terms of threes, I know, I know that you know we touched on that a little bit earlier. Every time you're talking or you're having a meeting or you're setting a strategy, what are the three things that really matter? And trying to distill really complicated things into simple sort of objectives, making sure that when you leave, you've spoken to a group or you've had a meeting or you've, you know, and, and even when you're writing into, you know, to work each day, you know, what are the, what are the three things you're going to do that can make a difference? And so I think I've, I, I've tended to try and, um, you know, leverage that to sort of cut through and focus. And it's a little bit of a mental trick. It's not literally always three things. And that's not to, you know, to say that that's always the answer, but I, I, do, I do, I do think it helps to focus you and, and, uh, maybe, um, uh, make clear the sort of short-term actions that, that, that you need to take to get where you want to go ultimately. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So, I mean, there's some incredible people at Rock Allbirds, right? I mean, Obama, you know, Oprah, Leonardo DiCaprio, who's also, by the way, an investor. Anyone in particular that, like, that was <laughs> that was wearing Allbirds and you were just, your mind was blown, right? Like you were so pumped that they were a fan of the brand. Yeah, I mean the the Obama thing was cool. Jacinda Ardern, she's a New Zealand Prime Minister. Pretty early on, she like became a fan, and that was pretty special. She's she's a you know, young, very dynamic leader in 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 the New Zealand context, and probably a number of people will have, will have heard her name. So there was this moment pretty early on when she sort of met the Australian Prime Minister and get, you know was wearing all birds and gave him a gift of all birds and this sort of stuff. And it was like, yeah, you know, it was like, okay, that one's we're, we're, you know, we've made it. <laughs> <laughs> I made it, man. I made it. That is awesome. So the show's called Game Changer. So real quick, last question. Who's a game changer or what game changer inspires you and why? Oh, you know, I'll, I'll go and, and I really, again, I hope you're not listening, but my co-founder, Joey, the, the partnership that we've had is, is probably one of the things I'm most proud of. He, uh, you know, I'm from New Zealand. He's from America. He's an engineer. I studied design. He's had a, a really successful kind of uh, corporate career prior to founding Allbirds. Like I, I had nothing. 
uh, like that. We've we've been different different in many ways, but the ability I think to partner with someone that uh, you know has different strengths from you, and I mean that's the basis again. We talked about sports and team. You know that's the basis of a great team, and I think and you know oftentimes we tend to gravitate towards. Uh, you know, people that are that are the same as us, and I think it's it's more interesting when you know when you you do someone who looks at the world completely differently, and it doesn't make it easy. We've had some big debates and discussions, and you know, do that on a daily basis. But I think you know, I think we brought them pretty early to the idea we can go to go further together and uh, than we can individually. So I, I'm I'm extraordinarily proud of that in terms of the, the all bird story. I love it. That's awesome. Tim, this is good stuff. I mean, I appreciate it, and and uh, I mean, this is changing the way I'll approach different things in my life and, and, and work. So thanks so much. What an awesome conversation. What a guy. Here are a few of my favorite takeaways from my conversation with Tim. Number one, this is good. Think big, act small. Tim learned this as an athlete. You don't get great overnight. He talked about the compounding interest that happens when you focus on getting better every day, when you trust the process. It's so true. Number two, seek feedback in every opportunity. I love the question that Tim asks everyone he interviews at Allbirds. What's a piece of feedback that had a profound impact on your professional career, and what's a piece of feedback that you've ignored? It's a cool one. Number three, be a goldfish. We think of goldfish as having short memories, which is sometimes what we need as entrepreneurs. I think it's great the way he frames this up. Process, absorb, and go again, right? Process the challenge, the the hiccup, the mistake at some level, potentially process that, absorb it, absolutely, and then go again, keep going. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.